Hi. I recently did an interview with um, Zach Cross, who is our junior designer in residence. Zach just recently graduated from Temple University. He's a very energetic young designer, but he doesn't have any experience in Rhino, Grasshopper, um, or our, the tools that we're coming out with soon called Land Kit. Um, so this interview is uh, in three parts. It's um, talking about topo kit, paving kit, and planting kit. Each of these is um, specific to a different whole area of landscape architecture. And I think it's a great intro for anyone who's curious about land kit or about rhino or grasshopper. So enjoy. This is topo kit, or sorry, paving kit. Paving kit lets you define an area, just like in topo kit where you define a sort of a plan material area and then project that to the topography. Here we're, we're creating an area and then populating that area with a pattern. And these are all the, the uh, parameters for the pattern. The first and most important is what is the pattern? So. If I look, if I roll over this, it says zero for grid, one for running bond, two for hex, three for try, four for herringbone, etc. So right now I'm on two for hex, and I can do um, one for herring, uh, running bond, or I can do, I think it's four for herringbone. Here's our herringbone. And we can actually add steps, so we can change the parameters of the herringbone. So we can say, oh, I want it to be six feet. Um, and it draws a lot faster because it's drawing a lot fewer pavers. But then we can say, I want it to have three step or four steps, um, which means that it's they're six by one and a half foot slabs of whatever, uh, which is probably crazy. Um, but yeah, I'm sure it's been done. Then there's, you know, so, so you're changing the steps, you know, like how, how many times it has to step over before it switches directions again, right? Okay. Um, then, once you have that, you, this is trimming them, so you, we could skip this and not trim them, and you'd get, you know, some pretty wacky, wacky stuff going on, uh, but, but not having to trim allows you, to, if you had a really big pattern, to kind of save maybe a little bit of time going back and forth trying to find the right pattern. And then once you're kind of set, you can plug it in. So, so, so the different components, they're set up in a particular way for like a general workflow, but you can plug and unplug these things as long as you're plugging things in the right place. Um, and most of the time there's, there's these prompts, you know, like so area, if I have a, an area you know, a paving area coming out, I can put in a paving area, right, here. So so what I do is I, I, you know, this area comes out, I trim the pavers in that area, just simply by plugging it in here, and I can actually get quantities for pavers and uncut and uncut. Um, and then, and then I'm creating, there's actually a color system that lets you Build color rules, so this is an attractor. So, uh, color attractor rule. And then there's um, a color palette. The color attractor rule says if if the pavers are, are within a certain distance of something, then they're at a certain point on this sort of conceptual gradient, right? Um, and you can kind of see that gradient. It's a, it's a little fuzzy, actually. Let me turn this on real quick. So I'm just drawing stuff on this attractor layer, and I, I'm using the outside boundary of this, and I just deleted it. I had like an inner attractor. But if I hide this now again, we can see that there's this 20 foot offset or so, and that's, you know, 20 feet there. So that's our maximum distance. And we can say, oh, I want that to be 30. 
And it, it's basically mixing the colors from from one side, from one end to the other of that gradient. Um, okay. And we can build them in different ways. We can say, you know, if, hey, I want um, this is actually building a multi mix, which build it takes all three colors in equal parts, and that's why they're kind of a, it's an equal mix around the outside edge. But then, kind of coming into the secondary mix, it's the two two of them, and then finally in the middle, it 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 tapers down to just one color, right? Just just this uh, single purple color. So we have you know one two three, um, one two, and then one color. It's a little complicated, but. The point of this is to show you that you can do mixes of pavers. So you could do like a light mix and a dark mix, dark mix, and then have them kind of fade, you know, into one another. Or you could have, or you could have four, four different colors that then mix in a kind of more of a rainbow, right? Um, yeah. Which I, I, it's not going to look quite as good, to be honest. Um, just in my experience. Then. Um, you draw the paving. It's as simple as plugging it in. Just like with the topo, you're just plugging it in and drawing it. Um, you're maybe changing a few parameters. In this case, it's color. You can actually change the positioning of the gradient. So if you want that middle register to be, instead of halfway, you, you want it to be kind of like a, a quarter of the way. You can put in positions. That's a little bit more advanced. Um, and then we project the pavers. So you don't necessarily have to project them. We could just plug them into, um, you know, we could plug them in to the next step and they could just be flat if you wanted. Um, what do you mean by project? Projecting means that they're being drawn down here on the XY plane. Okay. And we are projecting them, we're using the current topo layer to project those pavers. So. While they look flat here, if the grade was changed, the pavers would follow that grade. Okay. Um, and they each paver tries to stay flat. Um, it doesn't turn. It, it actually is kind of skewed, but it, it tries to stay flat. Um, so that it's kind of a trade-off. That's so that things look really good in a render. Um, and we want to kind of do a version where where it's sort of like you're simu almost like simulating to see how well like if you do have a a heavier terrain like like what's happening are the pavers like going to be out of whack you know so, but that that's something where we haven't done yet finally you can you can create um, you can apply a random texture to that projected paver and and bake it. Um, and that looks like this. Turn this on. So that looks like this. Um, each of these maps is slightly offset and, and sort of rotated so that if you had a texture that was like maybe a little more varied, you could get a pretty, a pretty nice kind of modeling happening um, with, with kind of a, you know, if you had a seamlessly repeating material texture this this would take that very nicely, um, and those those textures, basically the material is on the layer in Rhino, but the texture is applied to the mesh before it's baked, so that the texture is sort of embedded in the mesh, in, in that paver mesh. So, see, I yeah, can is, I can select it. Yeah, go ahead. Finish your question. Sorry. Uh, is the mesh like the? I don't know. I guess I'm confused about the mesh. Do you add the mesh onto that? Does it just build its own mesh based on these components? Yeah. Okay. Each paver mesh gets built automatically inside a grasshopper, and then you're just you're baking it into Rhino. You're just hitting that button, bake, and it just. It it puts it, it on makes whatever. Similar to render. Yeah, it's very similar to render. Yeah, it's okay. sort of like. Yeah, um, only in Grasshopper, like everything that's in Grasshopper, you can only really manipulate using Grasshopper components, right? Um, 
and we we're trying to set things up so that people can um so that that there's a template and you are kind of like can almost hit the ground running with this but then you can go in and say hey like what if i can i actually manipulate this first before i put that there and you know and and maybe you try something maybe it breaks but maybe you come up with kind of you know something innovative there's a lot of folks who use grasshopper and we're, we're hoping that this can also tie into their knowledge um but it's also we, we also want to kind of um help beginners to understand like why this is a better workflow in in so many ways than than trying to draw contours elevate those contours bring them into a 3d program make a tin that sucks um <laughs> You know, split it and then have somebody tell you you have to change it. Yeah. Right. But whereas here, you're you're kind of drawing things in plan. You're 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 very very directly sort of saying where you want things in 3D space with geometries, and then um, and it creates a really really nice model. And then um, if somebody asks you to change it, you say, "Cool, I'll <laughs> I'll have it done in like no time." Um, yeah, th that's the hope anyways. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to deny that there's going to be a learning curve for beginners for definitely, but even, even folks who know some grasshopper, I, I think this will take a little bit of getting used to. It's not going to be, you know, the first time you used AutoCAD or SketchUp, I'm sure you were just like, what's going on? You know, um, yeah. this is, this is going to have some similarities to that. Um, and it's you know it's it's not for folks who know absolutely nothing about 3D. Um, it, it's it's for folks who are trying to do 3D and are frustrated because they can't they can't do 3D very well. They can't do landscape very well in 3D because there's not tools out there for it. 